Shalom. All praises, blessings, glories, and honors to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Racha Kodash. Double honors to my Ella apostles and Bishop Ella's great millstone who have taught me this truth as well of men of like mind. Shalom wa chasad, which means peace and mercy to the elect of the nation of Israel, whom are you so-called Negroes, Latinos, Native American Indians, and Israelite foreigners of the sea land of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob whom are scattered here in America, which is Babylon the Great, and abroad. To you I say Shalom, and Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Ratza. This lesson is edifying and informative. The inspiration for this show came from the fact that the Spirit has been having the Ella Apostles Bishop elders and elder brothers doing edifying shows on the destruction of America by way of thermonuclear missiles, which is according to biblical prophecy. And so, Abaratiza, this lesson is edifying. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 16. Behold, I and the I is referring to the Heavenly Father Yahweh through his Son our Lord and Savior Yahweh Shai have created the Smith. Now what is a Smith? A Smith is a worker in metal. Treat metal by heating, hammering, and forging it. Other definitions include from the dictionary.com to forge on an anvil formed by heating and pounding or rather collectively one who works in metal by pounding or hammering metal in heat that is a smith and who is a smith that the Lord Yahweh through his son Yahweh Shai referring to here the German scientist To be more specific, there was a man by the name of Robert Abraham Esau. And Robert Abraham Esau was known as the father of the Uranian Club, which is basically the parent club that inspired the Manhattan Project which was based upon the development of the little man or little boy and fat man nuclear well not nuclear but atomic bombs rather excuse me that were dropped upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II and so Mainly the Smith is referring to the nuclear scientists and particularly the Germans which are renowned for their engineering. In fact the Germans are known according to the scriptures as the wise men of Timon. The Timonites are Edomites. Okay. Now let's read up a little bit on Abraham Esau, who was a German physicist. 
He was born on June 7, 1884, and he had died on May 12, 1955. After receipt of his doctorate from the University of Berlin, Esau worked at Tele Funking where he pioneered very high frequency VF or VHF rather excuse me waves using radar, radio and television and he was president of the Deutsche Tele Funken Verband during World War I he was a prisoner of war of the French he was reparated to Germany in 1919 in 1925, he was appointed professor at the University of Jena, where he also served as rector. From 1933, Esau was the state council in Thuringia, if I pronounce that correctly. From 1937, Esau was heard, excuse me, was head of the physics section of the newly created Reich Research Council. RFR. From 1939, he was a professor at the University of Berlin and president of the Reich Physical and Technical Institute. From his position in the RFR, he initiated the first meeting of the Uranium Club in early 1939. And so, Abraham Esau was the founder of the Uranium Club. It reads on to say, the precursor to the Army Ordnance Office, HWA, German Nuclear Energy Project, that is the Uranium Club, which began in September of that year. And the HWA gave control of the project to the RFR in 1942. ESA became the plenipotentiary, which a plenipotentiary or just simply a diplomat is a person especially a diplomat invested with the full power of independent action on behalf of their government typically in a foreign country having full power to take independent action of power absolute so he became the absolute power of nuclear physics and was in control of the project. In 1944, ESA became the plenipotentiary of the high frequency engineering and radar working group. During World War II, ESA was one of the most powerful physicists in Germany. So he was one of the most powerful physicists in Germany along with other contemporaries such as Einstein, so on and so forth. After World War II until 1948, Esau was a prisoner of war of the Dutch. From 1949, Esau was a visiting professor of shortwave technology at the RWTH, excuse me, Aken. From 1953, he was also head the Institute of High Frequency Engineering of the German Aeronautical Research Institute. To expound further on the Iranian club, it states that from this position in the RFR, he would play, he as in Robert Abraham Esau, would play major roles in the German nuclear energy project sometimes also referred to as the Uran v rain or the Uranian Club. World War II and the Uran v rain Shortly after the discovery of nuclear fission in December 1938 to January 1939, the 
Uranvirain, i.e. the German Nuclear Energy Project, had an initial start in April before being formed a second time under the HWA Army Ordnance Office in September. Now, let us further understand what the Uran Bain, or simply the Uranian Club, was about. This is from dpedia.org about German nuclear weapons program. The Uran Bain, Uran, excuse me, or just simply the Uranian Club, or the Uranian Project, Uran Project, was a name given to the project in Germany to research nuclear technology. And this had paved the way for the Manhattan Project, which again was a project that was based upon the development of the Little Boy and Fat Man atomic bombs, which then later gave way to nuclear warheads the first one being the the czar bomba that was created by the soviet union which we'll get into all that lord's ruling as we uh, go on in the lesson and the design of the first nuclear warhead was inspired after the design of two scientists and collectively this design became known as the teller ulam design which is basically a design of a bomb within a bomb within a bomb where you had a warhead that detonates after the chain reactions of both fusion and fission and we'll get into all that abaratiza because the scripture says that the elements shall melt with fervent heat and we'll see exactly why it says was a name given to the project in Germany to research nuclear technology, including nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors during World War II. It went through several phases of work, but in the words of historian Mark Walker, it was ultimately frozen at the laboratory level with the modest goal to build a nuclear reactor which could sustain a nuclear fission chain reaction for a significant amount of time and to achieve the complete separation of at least tiny amount of the uranium isotope which they were able to achieve pardon me through the Manhattan Project the scholarly census is that it failed to achieve these goals and that despite fears at the time the Germans had never been close to producing nuclear weapons. And this is why, this is why you had all these different uh, prestigious scientists from around the world, and particularly Einstein, that had came together with others to develop the first two atomic warheads, Fat Man and Little Boy, that were then uh, subsequently dropped upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. And so now we have gained the knowledge and understanding through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bahashim Yahweh Shai who has allowed us to understand who Robert Abraham Esau was and what the Uranian club or the Uranian project that he had founded was and how it had basically led to the Manhattan Project. So again, this is Isaiah chapter 54 verse 16. So now we know what the smith is. Again, it says, Behold, I have created the smith, which again, the smith represents the nuclear scientist, but in particular, the German nuclear scientist. And to go even further, Robert Abraham Esau, who was the pioneer of the Uranium Club. 
that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And what is that instrument? What we see today that are known as the intercontinental ballistic nuclear warheads or missiles. And I've created the waster to destroy, which are the nuclear missiles. And according to Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25, these are the weapons of the Lord's indignation. Now, we're reading Isaiah chapter 54, verse 16, in the CSB and in NLT. In the CSB, it reads, look, I have created the craftsman who blows on the charcoal fire and produces a weapon suitable for its task. And what weapon, again, is that referring to? That will be utilized as a suitable weapon for the Lord's indignation in which he will use according to biblical prophecy to destroy the land of the Chaldeans, which is America, Babylon, the great, the nuclear missiles. Okay, it says, and I have created a destroyer to cause havoc. And in the NLT, it says, I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals beneath the forge and makes the weapons of destruction. Oh, I love this. And I have created the armies that destroy. So the Lord have created that army, which are the armies of the nuclear missiles. And we can read about those in the book of Jeral. The second chapter that mentions the armies that the Lord will use to destroy this land, America, Babylon the Great, which he referred to as the land of involved villages in the book of Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, that dwelleth carelessly. <laughs> now, before we move on to the next few scriptures, Earlier, I'd mentioned the inspiration that led to the development of the first nuclear warhead, which was the Tsar Bomba that had been developed by the Soviet Union, which, according to past data, the war that was said to contain a maximum yield of 101 megatons of TNT. And because of this sheer destructive force, they had to cut it in half. Nonetheless, it was still powerful enough to send shockwaves across various parts of the world. And the equivalent of the Tsar Bomba today would be the Satan II ICBM that is possessed by the Russians now this is from blog a nuclear secrecy .com, in search of a bigger boom it reads the scientist Edward Teller according to one account kept a blackboard in his office at Los Alamos during World War II with a list of hypothetical nuclear weapons on it the last item on his list was the largest one he could imagine. And the Lord had later on given these devils the knowledge and the understanding to create said largest one that Edward Teller had imagined. The method of delivery, weapon design, or jargon for how you get your bomb from here to there, the target was listed as a backyard as a scientist who related this antidote explained since that particular design would probably kill everyone on earth there was no use carting it anywhere teller was an inventive creative person when it came to imagining new and previously unheard of weapons not all of his ideas panned out, of course, 
What he rarely let that stop is enthusiasm for them. He was seemingly always in search of a bigger bomb. Hmm. During the Manhattan Project, and this is where things get very interesting, brothers and sisters, and Abaratazai, I pray that, you know, you brothers and few sisters have been following along thus far. It says he quickly tried, <laughs> I guess they had meant to say tried, but nonetheless, it says he quickly tired of working on the regular atomic bomb, or basically he got quickly tired of working on the regular atomic bomb. It says it just seemed too easy, a problem for engineering, not physics. From as early as 1942, he became obsessed with the idea of a super bomb. The hydrogen bomb. Another name for the hydrogen bomb is the nuclear bomb. A weapon of theoretically endless power. One side effect of this at Los Alamos is that Teller passed much of his assigned work on the atomic bomb off to a subordinate, Claus Fuchs if I pronounce his last name correctly. It took over a decade for the hydrogen bomb to come into existence. A decade is 10 years. The reason for the delay were technical as well as interpersonal. In short, though, Teller's initial plan, a bomb where you could just ignite, pardon me, an arbitrary long candle of fusion fuel wouldn't work but it was hard to show that it wouldn't work shortly after abandoning that idea more or less completely tell her with the spur from stan ulam and this is where the ulam or the teller ulam design comes into light came up with a new design the teller ulam design okay so it says the teller ulam design allows you to link bombs to bombs to bombs john wheeler apparently dubbed this a sausage model because of all the links ted taylor recounted that from very early on it was clear you could have theoretically an infinite number this is why they're able to create nuclear missiles with multiple warheads at the top and these are known as MIRV warheads, M-I-R-V, if I remember correctly. A brother can fact check that and leave it in the uh, description of this lesson. M-I-R-V or M-A-R-V, multiple reentry uh, something something. I forgot the uh, acronym for it. Anyhow, it reads on to say, again, Ted Taylor recounted that from very early on it was clear you could have theoretically an infinite number of sub bombs sub means under connected to make one giant bomb and here we have a depiction a few selected frames from Chuck Hansen's pardon me diagram about multi or multi-stage hydrogen bombs from his U.S. nuclear weapons, a secret history drawn by Mike Wagon, <laughs> and at the top, the top compartment, the primary stage, that's where the phenomenon of fusion occurs, and then below that is where fission occurs. Okay, I'll Lord's willing later show some more examples of this. <clears throat> it says the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated as a so-called Tsar Bomba of the Soviet Union. See that? On 1961, it was exploded off the island of Novia Zemelya, well within the Arctic Circle. It had an explosive equivalent to 50 million tons of TNT or 50 megatons of TNT. It was only detonated at half power, see? The full-sized version would have been 100 megatons. It is thought to have been a three-stage bomb. By contrast, 
the largest U.S. bomb ever detonated was the Castle Bravo, tested in 1954, with 50 megatons yield. It was apparently only a two-stage bomb. Here we have depictions of the Tsar bomb being dropped in 1961 also known as an age bomb or just simply a nuclear bomb we usually talk about the czar bomb as if it represented the absolute bigger boom ever contemplated and a product of unique soviet circumstances we also talk about as if its giant size was completely impractical both of these notions are somewhat misleading <laughs> It says the initial estimate for the explosive force, excuse me, of the super bomb being contemplated during World War II was only equivalent to 100 megatons of TNT, as James Content wrote at Van Nevar Bush in 1944. It seemed that the possible or the possibility, rather, excuse me, of inciting a thermonuclear reaction involving heavy hydrogen is somewhat less now than appeared at first sight two years ago. I had an hour's talk on this subject by the leading theoretical man at Los Alamos. The most hopeful procedure is to use tritium, the radioactive isotope of hydrogen made in a pile, as a sort of booster in the reaction. The fizzle bomb being used as the detonator and the reaction involving the atoms of liquid deuterium being the primary explosive, such a gadget should produce an explosive equivalent to 100 million tons of TNT. Teller was aiming for a Tsar bomba from the very beginning. Whether they would have supported dropping such a bomb on Hiroshima where it available is something worth contemplating. Both the U.S. and USSR looked into designing 100 megaton warheads that would fit onto ICBMs. The fact that the Tsar bomber was so large doesn't mean that such a design had to be so large. Or that being large necessarily would keep it from being part, excuse me, being put on the tip of a giant missile. Neither went forward with these. And the point has already been read, so what I'll do is I'll leave the blog or the link to this blog in the description box of the lesson so now we have gotten more insight and understanding of what inspired or what led to the creation of hydrogen or simply thermonuclear uh, bombs or missiles that we see today it was through uh, the breakthrough of the Teller Ulam design, okay, through the spread of Pali Yahweh Shemi Shai, the Wadi Yahweh Shemi Shai, for allowing us to understand and uh, gain the knowledge of this, okay. So now let's go back to the scriptures. This is the book of Revelation. Because the Lord, well, before I go to Revelation, let's get Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25. This is Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25. It says, The Lord Yahweh hath opened his armory. And what is an armory? <coughs> let's find out what an armory is. Armory is a storehouse, a treasury, the conventional definition reads arsenal, arms the depot, arms cash, ammunition dump. So the Lord had opened up his arms cash or, or his ammunition dump and had brought forth the weapons of his indignation which are the ICBM nuclear missiles 
The word indignation means righteous anger. And the weapons of our Lord's righteous anger are the weapons in which he had put upon the smiths of Esau Edom to create, which are the nuclear scientists, and particularly the German nuclear scientists, so that he may later on use it as his instrument to destroy America, Babylon the Great, according to biblical prophecy. For this is the work of the Lord Yahweh of hosts, which is Yahweh of armies in the land of the Chaldeans. And what is the modern day land of the Chaldeans prophetically? America, Babylon the Great. And the Lord will utilize these weapons during the third world's woe, which cometh quickly. And it will come after the mark of the beast has been mandated globally which the mark of the beast is the rfid microchip also known as the nfc chip implant in europe also known as the biochip the word bio means alive or living also known as the brain chip implant and so this is the book of revelation chapter 11 verse 14 the second woe is past so war or two has passed and behold the third woe cometh quickly and the third world that cometh quickly is World War Tree, And that is why the Lord has been putting it upon the spirits of these different leaders of these different nations, their uh, generals, their mighty men, to prepare for war. By beating their plowshares into swords and their puna hooks into spears. That is to say, by taking their economic wealth and using them towards the research, development, modification, and enhancements of weapons of mass destruction and creation, primarily for ICBM nuclear missiles, which again are the weapons of the Lord's indignation. And this war will be one that will be fought with burning and fuel of fire, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5. Which reads, for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. So when we examine ancient wars that were fought between nations, they would send their soldiers, their mighty men, upon uh, vast plains, battlefields, with swords, spears, lances, arrows, and bows, to impale and trust true and chop off the heads and body parts of their adversaries. But this war, that is the Third World's War, which comes quickly, will be a war that will be fought with burning and fuel of fire. As it will state here, it says, For every battle of the warriors will confuse noise and garments rolled in blood. But this, that is the Third World's War, shall be with burning and fuel of fire. All right, so it's going to be a war of burn, burning and fuel of fire. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 19. Through the wrath, through the indignation of the Lord Yahweh of hosts, is the land dark in what land? America, Babylon, the great, according to biblical prophecy. And the people shall be as the fuel of the fire, because the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, save the Lord Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. According to Malachi chapter 1 verse 4. Excuse me, 4 verse 1. Pardon me. Alright. No man shall spare his brother. And that will be shown during the time of Jacob's trouble. See, the scripture jumps back and forth. Now... Let's go to the book of Job, the 20th chapter, because remember, it states in verse 5 that this war will be fought with burning and fuel of fire. What's going to cause that? Again, the nuclear missiles. But how will they spark? How will they detonate? Let's find out. This is the book of Job, chapter 20. Pardon me. Verse 
20... I'll start at 24. It says, He, which is referring to the elites of Esau, Edom, shall flee from the iron weapon, which are the nuclear missiles. And the bow of steel, which are the nuclear warheads, shall strike him through. It is drawn, drawn from where? The nuclear silos. And coming out of the body, which are the nuclear silos. Yea, the glittering sword coming out of his gall. Right, just like a sword would, would be drawn out of its sheath by a warrior. So will the ICBM nuclear missiles, which are likened unto swords, be drawn out of their bodies or nuclear uh, silos. The glittering sword, just like in the movie, the, the, the warrior takes out the sword, he holds it up into the air, and the sun uh, beams upon it, and causing it to glitter. That's how it's going to look once those nuclear missiles leave those nuclear silos. The engine that propels them from one continent to the next, the fire that they generate that causes them to go from one continent to the next, it's going to make it seem like a glittering sword coming out of his gall terrors are upon him all darkness shall be hid in the secret places and this is the point a fire not blown shall consume him and that is how the nuclear missiles are going to detonate they're going to be detonating through their fire not being blown but what does that really mean well we'll find out through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashimi Shai shortly lords willing after we finish reading the scripture it shall go ill with him that is left in his tabernacle now how does a nuclear missile detonate how does the fire get generated now typically a fire is generated through what is known as a fire triangle where it requires air oxygen and fuel or fuel oxygen and heat all right and this is known as a fire triangle but a fire not blown is going to consume this man's skin because that's how the nuclear missiles are going to detonate they're going to detonate through what is known as the chain reactions of fusion and fission fission is, is a splitting of large atoms into two or more smaller ones and fusion is a joining of two or more lighter atoms into a larger one and when we look at nuclear fission in contrast to nuclear fusion we clearly see this in the depictions uh, below now this image here from energy release was uh, from an engineering course I'd taken a couple of years ago called uh, Properties of Material, where you know we studied uh, heat transfer and these sorts of stuff. Now the heat that is generated by the chain reaction of fission is approximately 1000 degrees Kelvin which is the same in degrees Celsius okay think of 1000 degrees Kelvin as a thousand degrees Celsius right and that's the the temperature or the heat that is generated through fission by fission now fusion generates about 100 million degrees Kelvin which is the same in degrees Celsius, right? And a modern nuclear warhead detonates through fusion and fission, even as seen here in the depictions below. We have a uranium bomb as a, you know, a, 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 a little boy. And then you had a plutonium bomb as Fat Man, right? And then you have a hydrogen bomb, which is an example of a modern nuclear warhead, where you have at the top, um, well, actually, the top uh, is, is 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 fission, and the bottom is where the fusion occurs. I actually had it backwards. Lock it for that. 
all right nonetheless it's uh, two chain reactions that occur uh, simultaneously the first stage is where you have the splitting of the atoms or the uh, atoms okay for hydrogen bomb and then the second stage is where uh, fusion occurs as we can see here in the depictions okay and remember keep in mind that the heat that is generated by fusion is about 100 million degrees Kelvin or degrees Celsius and fission is only about a thousand which is extremely um, extremely extremely hot it is stated that the heat that is generated by uh, a, a nuclear missile is uh, tens of thousands of times hotter than the interior of the Sun so it's like basically you're placing the Sun in the middle of the atmosphere um, times a greater number but anyway this is why the scripture says here in 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 10 to 12 that the elements shall melt with fervent heat verse 10 it says but the day of the Lord Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise this current rulership is going to pass away with a great noise by reason of those nuclear missiles being detonated across uh, various parts of the earth but primarily here in America Babylon the Great and then over there in the land of Israel because the Lord is going to completely clean that land out of the filth that dwells over there according to biblical prophecy and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and so now through the spirit and power Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai we have gained more more understanding and insight brothers and sisters of what the Lord means when he said fervent heat because the temperatures that these nuclear missiles the weapons of his indignation will generate will be uh, unprecedentedly hot ex extremely hot literally everything will melt okay all the elements <laughs> will uh, become equal to the heat that those nuclear missiles uh, generate and that's known as equilibrium it says the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons are you to be in all holy conversations and godliness and we ought to be in fear of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai exceedingly because the Lord is about to bring some serious judgment man we don't want to be down here when the Lord brings uh, you know the nuclear destruction because you know the lord through the holy spirit is showing us why you know we won't want to be down here i mean come on man 100 million degrees uh celsius and then on top of that you, you have a, an additional a thousand and that varies based upon the yield of the warhead so that times two hundred thousand thousand. that's <laughs> man that's that's some that's some extreme indig indignation so we pray that the Lord deliver us from you know the destruction to come and this is why the Lord said this in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 12 and this shall be the plague wherewith where, 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 where the Lord Yahweh will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet literally and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, literally, and also figuratively their hopes for the future, and their tongue, literally, and also figuratively, you know, all of the mess that they've been talking, all the scoffing and the scornings, shall consume away in their mouth. Psalms chapter 21, verse 9, Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord Yahweh shall swallow them up in his wrath. And the fire shall devour them. So the Lord is going to devour all those that have uh, fought against the elect of the nation of Israel. Which by default, they fight against the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord is a man of war. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And as the Father is, so is the Son. 
So, <laughs> amen. We pray that the Lord, Yahweh Bashem Yahushai, deliver us. Baba Kashai, Yahweh Bashem Yahushai, Hawashai now, which means deliver us. Baba Kashai. From, you know, the coming destruction because it's going to be serious, man. Last scripture, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch or nothing. You'll be left here in America, Babylon the Great, man. When the Lord completely destroys it with nuclear fire, according to biblical prophecy. And remember, according to Revelation chapter 9, verse 16, <clears throat> and the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand and i heard the number of them so the number of the army of the horsemen that the lord will have in battle array to invade the land of america babylon the great which are the icbm nuclear missiles will be two hundred thousand thousand two hundred million intercontinental ballistic nuclear warheads because they are in fact the army this is George chapter 2 verse 4 the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen so shall they run like the noise of chariots and tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devour the stubble as a strong people set in battle array so these missiles are likened unto a great army that the Lord is going to mobilize through these different nations to send upon America Babylon the Great through shooting them upon America Babylon the Great and they're not going to break their ranks they're going to leap over the walls they're going to leap over those nuclear defense systems of America Babylon the Great and destroy her with fire according to biblical prophecy <laughs> so with that I conclude this lesson for inspire me to do this lesson to edify the elect and um i'll be right this out you brothers and few sisters you know all right we're able to be edified and learn something you know and um especially for those of you that are uh, new to the faith you know these things are all a part of biblical prophecy and um you know with that being said i say shalom to the elect until the next i'll be right this out. shalom